Okay, I'm ready. So the question today is, what's the question of today? And this is a question that authors have almost every time they sit down at the keyboard is what am I doing here? Diana, welcome to Reality Coaching for Writers, where today we're going to talk about highly successful habits of writers. Welcome. What's our, what's our tagline again? Maybe that should have been our question. <laughs> we offer no fluff, just the real stuff that can help writers succeed. Right. So last week we got uh, bumped off by uh, pirates in a, in a nasty storm. And uh, so we're going to pick up the day with uh, about halfway through our list. We talked about the effective time managers and what that means, what an effective time manager, how it applies to writers. Yeah. And you've got some thoughts on this, I think, because you, you spend a lot of time managing your time and, and your client's time. Right, right. Well, I do a simple thing called um, I make a list every evening for the next day and sometimes two days in advance um, if I'm you know, ha juggling quite a few projects, but I title it MIT, most important task. And I start with the priority and then I go down from there. And once in a while, I have to move one of those tasks to the following day, or perhaps it's a task that shows up every day when I'm working on uh, one particular client's manuscript, then their name is going to show up every day on my most important task list. But um, one thing, Eddie, you know that I've added to my list is personal writing time. And as a writer, um, I'm realizing, boy, if we don't schedule it, we do not write. And I know, Eddie, you, you're pretty strict about your writing schedule. Yeah, I mean, because like you said, if you don't write it, I mean, it, you know, there's, if, if you don't write it, it it's not, it's not going to get written probably. It's just, that's the reality. Um, I, I can't remember, you know, Stephen James used to talk about, um, he used to tell the parable of the man who was given lots of talents, but he, or he only had the one talent. He had the one talent, the one good idea, right? But he never did anything with it. It was this great novel idea that he was going to work on. He'd scribble some notes, but he never got around to writing the story, right? And then years later, he, you know, found the manila envelope, a little folder, and he went back through to look at his notes. He was going to start the story. And when he looked at it, there was nothing on the pages. It was like all the ink had gone away. And that's what happens when you don't write your own, you know, build it in, you lose, you literally lose the inspiration and the ideas that, that you had. They, they're not there and you can't get them back. Right. You can't. No, you don't. And many writers start out um, working a full-time job. So they actually, some have started, I know um, even Cindy Sproles would rise earlier than her normal time and write before she went to work and punched a time clock, you know, and she's a successful published writer now. So you've got to find a way early in the morning. Um, I'm best in the morning, late at night. I don't want to, that's my playtime. <laughs> so I don't want to work, but it's got to be scheduled or yeah. it won't happen. Yeah. So and I, for me, it, it, the advantage, one of the advantages is once you've been doing this a while, I, I like to keep at least two projects going at a time. One is a new project where I'm having, I have to be creative and I'm in the middle of doing this front full gallon, this call I was in the middle of that trying to come up with dialogue, which is hard. I mean, it, you know, there's nothing there, you know, and you've got to create this out of nothing, right? And that, that sometimes, that's, I mean, it can be really hard. So that's the creative process. But I also like to be, working on a project that's almost completely completed or halfway completed, you know, where it's just kind of cleaning up the, it's like building a house. You've got one house, there's nothing but the lot you're getting ready to start. The other one over here is almost completed. You go to the one that's almost completed, you're cleaning up things, you're sweeping it down, you see the completion almost there, and you feel good about that. You're satisfied that you're almost there with this one. And then when you go back to the one you're just starting, you can be a little bit discouraged because you see how much work is there, but because you're encouraged by the other one, you're going, yes, I've but I've always done that one. So I can do this one again. I can do this one again. For me, that helps. That process That's helps. Good. That's a good tip. Yeah. Um, and so Eddie, how about the next one? You, you take 
con connect with the right people. That's a habit of highly yeah. successful yeah. writers. Yeah. And before I jump in, the only other thing I would, about, I would add oh. about time management is for me, um, I, I do prioritize things that are time sensitive. Okay, so if there's a if there's a deadline, like you and I were about before we came and we were talking about something, um, and that's not a time sensitive task. It can be done almost any time, and the sooner we get it done, the better. But it's it's not a deadline. But deadline things, kind of like preparing for a writers conference, you know, we can put that off until you have to go, and then you you better be ready, right? So those are yeah. time sensitive. So you can't ignore everything. The time sensitive things do begin to creep into the, the fun stuff. But yeah, connecting with the right people, um, that's, a, that's really, you know, there was a book, I forgot what it was years ago, what talked about uh, know, influencers and connectors, and I forgot now the name of the book. Um, it was really popular. I've got a copy somewhere. Um, but there were four types of individuals that we needed to connect with. And um, the principle of the book made perfect sense. The implementation in the book I never could figure out how to implement it because we don't really necessarily control who we connect with. I think the younger generation probably does a better job of this. They're probably intentional about it, um, but I'm, I'm not intentional about it, you know. Um, so, the, the, but connecting with the right people, um, it is important. Uh, and I had, you know, I, I think for me, that happens more uh, from, the, from the spirit. Uh, the spirit leads people into my life. That I, that need to be I need to be connected with, um, and that's probably how it works for me. But uh, if I were to go out and say I need to connect to the right people, I would say, well, I need to connect with people on social media or influencers that can influence my book and you know make it a success. Yeah, I do, but that's a selfish motivation. So for me, it's really hard to get jazzed up about that. You know. Um, well, and I I remember um, our friend Tori. Um, he would talk about a percentage of his time he spent investing in other people, tithing in his time to invest in other people. And so a lot of his social media, of course, it had to be promoting his, you know, screenplays, his, his uh, productions that he acted in, but also um, he took a literal 10% of his day and he spent it promoting and helping other people. And I think that's a, a, a principle that we could uh, apply that it's when what flows in, you have to give some out. You've got to um, connect in those ways that um, you need to for your own work sake, but also um, tithe some time into others and promoting and helping others. So that's a good way that you'll find all successful, highly successful people, whether they're writers, entrepreneurs, coaches, that's how they operate. Yeah, and there's and then, you know it's it, it's biblical. I mean this is a yeah. this is a this is a Jesus wisdom. He said whatever you give you're gonna get back in return. So if you give yeah. your time to other people, eventually you're gonna get it back somewhere. In the other way, but if you don't give, if you, if, you know, if you're like me, you just sit in the cave and you never engage or something like that, well, then don't expect a whole lot of people to be flocking to you because they don't know about you, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they're, they've yeah. never heard of you before. So you do, you do have to be out there giving of yourself. But the, but the caveat is when we do that, do not look for the harvest right away and don't look, don't look for the payback from the people yeah. that you're investing in. Because if you do that, then it's a transaction. And if it's a transaction, Jesus says, you've already received your reward, your reward for that. That was just yeah. a transaction. You're not gonna get anything else out of that. So oh, you, give, good. you give to one person and don't expect it from them, but be expecting sometime down the road somebody else to come out of the blue to help you. And you, you won't yeah. even know who they are, right? Which is good. Yeah. So, so the, next, the next one on the list is focus on, on our strengths and hone our skills. So how yes. do we go about doing that? <laughs> oh, boy. You know, um, writing, I don't know why some people think they can just decide, okay, I finally have time to write. 
I had this great idea. And, and they just expect to sit down and dash it off and it's ready for print. And they, they aren't really um, familiar with the rules and the, uh, in their particular genre or what's marketable and all these elements that come along with writing. It's, I mean, we would never expect a neurosurgeon to just decide one day to be a neurosurgeon and then right away show up in the operating room. So um, there are skills. Now, there are some people that come with a gift, but if they don't continue to hone their gift, um, another person that wasn't born with that particular leaning, you know, gifting, um, they can eventually surpass them in excellence because they continue and continue on. It's, I heard it said once in a, um, I think it was the book, The Obstacle is the Way. And they talked about tennis pros that from childhood prodigies, childhood prodigies, that if a childhood prodigy did not eventually get beyond just their gift and hone their skill, they, they ended up being frustrated um, to the point where uh, others that did not start out with the, the childhood gifting surpassed them and excelled. And you see some of this on the tennis court where they pitch a fit and they um, don't like when they start to lose to someone that they feel isn't of their caliber, but it's because they reached their, their, um, the limit of their gifting and did not continue to hone their skills. So writing is the same way. You should always be perfecting it. You should always be uh, a learner and someone that is um, continuing to sharpen their blade and get better. Some people might not realize this, but successful people fit exercise into your schedule because especially writers need to do this because they sit sedentary at a desk and um, you will over the years pay a price for that. If you don't make a point to get up, move about and exercise. Another benefit of exercise and neuroscience um, validates this is you will come up with better ideas. You'll be more focused. You'll uh, just, uh, be able to stay on point when you have regular exercise. So that is definitely something that will benefit every, every writer and successful writers know to include exercise into their regime. Yeah, for me, it's it's walking. It used to be swimming. I, I wish I could go back to doing swimming because uh, I really miss it. Um, but I really enjoyed swimming because I, I could get into a zone swimming and I came up with ideas and I worked plots out. Now, and now it's I just have to go back to doing my walking. Sometimes when I'm surfing, that that's really when I get ideas because I'm mm. in a completely different environment. And um, yeah, kind of the same thing on surfing. You're focused on the horizon all the time, so it's kind of like you're almost daydreaming because you're looking at, looking out here, but at the same time your mind is doing things right. So that's for me. Um, but I think to your point, Diana, it, it's your body knows that it's no longer in a sedentary position. So it, the brain is actually more engaged in the environment yeah. because it's looking around possibly for danger, right? Or for mm -hmm. entertainment uh, or for excitement, right? So the, so the brain is, act, is working in different parts of, you know, working, doing things in a different way. And that generates ideas that you wouldn't normally have. I'll also tell you, uh, for me as a writer, I used to get frustrated with interruptions a lot. I'd get really frustrated. Um, you know, Benny came in and interrupted me. If the dog comes in, the dog does this all the time. Diane. The <laughs> dog comes in and, you know, puts his nose down. That means that he's got to go out. So I've got to stop what I'm doing in the middle of this. I have learned, at least certainly with the dog, that's God's way of telling me to stop, get up. There's a problem. There's a problem. It's it literally the Holy Spirit prompts me. I, this is weird, but prompts me by the dog. And I'll mm -hmm. get up and go let the dog out. And when I come back, I'll look at that line and I'll go, oh, yeah, that, this thing, this doesn't work. Right. So 
there is just that moving around. The same thing when you get up and go get a glass of water, you go brush your teeth, you go down and mm-hmm. unload the dishwasher. It takes you 10, 15 minutes. You come back and you'll see things on the page you didn't see when you were sitting there. And it's it's just all part of that little bit of the exercise, I think. Yes, yes. That's good. That's very good. So what about organize your space, dedicated writing space? What does that look like? And I, I'm looking around when, you, when I'm asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> At your organized space? <laughs> yeah. I find that, um, it again, it works with our brain. When we are untidy, when there's a mess, it tends to, our thoughts tend to, you know, be messy. And I think if you have things organized and you have a set place, you can function as a mother, as a parent, as um, a husband, a wife, or any roommate situation. But when you have an assigned space and everyone in the house knows, okay, uh, he or she is in there, that space, they are working. And it really, it helps those around you, but it also helps you to put on that hat and function in that uh, capacity. So having a dedicated space, I know we recommend it to have an altar to meet with God, a place to meet with God, you know, because when you do, when you have that dedicated space to meet with God, you meet with him more often. You, yeah. you It becomes a special place. And so same with the writer, put your writer hat on and go to your place and and do the work yeah and i'll add that you know if you do if you can't build a space because not everybody can right you know you you may may live in a house where there is no place for the writer to go the the writer's having to sit in the same room with everybody else um so i recommend having a wardrobe change a a favorite two or three favorite outfits shirts hat you mentioned hat but you know a shirt right Pants, something that designates this is my writing outfit, just so that you know this is your your writing outfit. You put your uniform on, and people around you know that's mom's uniform. Don't don't go over and bother her. She's sitting there with a laptop. She's working, so that somebody doesn't have to ask that. you, are you writing while you've got your laptop? They know you're writing, and they know not to interrupt you, right? So that's that's kind of one way. Even if you don't have a space, just put the put the headphones on and have the laptop and just go at it and just get into your zone you know you do this and you can do it in an airport you can do it on a plane you can yeah. do it at your home you can do it at, you know a coffee shop um you're again it's a psychological thing you know yeah. and if if you think about it we have to be able to do that diana because um otherwise the enemy will come and steal our space and if yeah. the enemy steals our space and they've stolen our story or the projects we're working on we can't let them exactly. do that Wow. You know? Yeah, that's so good, Eddie. I love that. Yeah, that's excellent. So I think the next one is number 10. It says, uh, are, be thankful. Or are we thankful? Talk about that one a little bit, Diana. Well, um, it's been noticed that in highly successful people um, at any level that they have grateful hearts. They're grateful. They realize that they didn't make it on their own to where they are if they're successful and they they stop and they thank those that help them get where they are. And part of that thankfulness is what we talked about connecting by pouring into others, uh, recognizing that it was those shoulders that you're standing on that have got you to the, the top. And so you'll often see uh, them acknowledging others and thanking other people but it's a heart of gratitude it's definitely a healthy habit of successful writers yeah and i'll i'll add that it, thankfulness is is the the positive way of saying this right so that we, we're talking about the, the positive aspects yeah. of being thankful and grateful and this the benefits that come from it so the, the caution here is that we need to be very vigilant to make sure that the bitterness doesn't creep in. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna be transparent and, and have a confession. I confessed last night to the writer's group, I mean, to the Jesus, our Jesus study down at Moore Square about this. Um, Sunday, when I went, went down to Moore Square, I was, you know, 
I was having a great day. I, you know, I had Sunday school class and went, went to church and then I was driving out of Moore Square, which is the highlight of my week to be down there with my people, you know, and, and I was in yeah. a good place until I saw my friend Alan, you know, he got beat up and Diana. Oh no. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I saw him and my spirit was just, it was devastating mm. to see him. Right? Mm. I mean, it just, it just changed the, the outlook of the day, but I picked up, I picked up, you know, after that and I left and I went around and gave the sandwich and the award and everything. And I was talking to one lady and she was, she had something she was bitter about. She was complaining about one individual. And I kept saying, you know, you just got to let it go. You just, if you carry this, it's a burden. It's going to weigh you down, right? So this is me preaching, preaching to her, teaching her. But on the way home, I, I realized that I, my spirit had changed. Something had changed about the day. It was, I wasn't in the place I normally was. And I carried that through the night. And until last night, until driving back down for the Jesus study, and it finally hit me, I had let bitterness come into my spirit. Mm. And it had stolen the peace that I have, right? Because I was trying to figure out why, why don't I have the peace that I normally have? And I realized it's because I opened a door and I let the spirit of bitterness come in. So I had to confess it, ask the Lord to take it away from me and get back in that place of peace. This is a long way of saying, if we have thankful hearts, will probably be have peace and if you mm. have peace then you can write if you have yeah. chaos and conflict you're going to have a difficult time writing because you're going to be complaining and looking at the negative and that's not mm. going to help us as writers looking at the negative oh that's good and the longer we practice um gratefulness the easier it is for us to recognize when that peace is missing you know, like you did, you recognized it. You said, "Hey, wait a minute, it took I'm me not." Twenty-four happy. hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. You know, it didn't take you months or years. You know, yeah. like we things used to take us. I mean, so as you practice that, and peace becomes your companion, then you notice when it's gone, and and you learn to ask those questions. Hey, wait a minute, where'd my peace go? What's going on? <laughs> so. Yeah, it it definitely having thankful heart is is uh, a blessing. Yeah, yeah, and I'll I'll add this because this is what we do. But when you were using the word peace, it, it's it's Jesus. It, mm -hmm. I mean, I hate to I, I shouldn't yeah. say, that, yeah. but it is Jesus. I mean, He says, "I am peace." So when mm -hmm. we have chaos, that's an indication we're not really as close to him right now as we were. Yeah. And that's, that's a chance to run back and go, I, I want to be back there. So the next one on the list is persistence. Persistence. How does that, what does that look like for a writer? Well, our writer friends that are well published, Eddie, we have seen them over the years. Just stay the course, stay the course. It, it's persistence is when you are rejected, which there is a lot of rejection in the publishing journey um, and the writing journey, but you stay the course, you hear, take the advice, you make the changes and, um, and you're persistent in the goal that God's put on your heart. You're persistent. If you believe you're a writer, then a writer you should be every day. Show up, keep showing up, keep showing up. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. But that's where those connections and those friends uh, and your prayer partners come in and support you. But definitely stay the course. That's again, all successful people do. They're persistent. They stay the course. They keep their yeah. goals in front of them. Yeah, and I, and I would say that um, even if you're published, I mean, one way to look at the persistence there is, you, you, again, you don't look at the sales. You don't look at the reviews. Because if you do, it's going to discourage you. So if you're working on projects, just keep doing the thing that you feel like you were called to do and keep better, getting better at it and keep producing. Yeah. Just keep producing. If we stop production, then we stop the process. That means there's just no other way to get around it. And But as a writer, if you keep producing bodies of work, at some point, something may actually hit. So you almost have to look at it and go, at some point, I'm going to have a bestseller. I'm going to have a bestseller one of these days. And when I have a bestseller, people are going to go, well, what else has he or she ever written I might like? And they're going to look back at the body of work that you've done and go, oh, this was great. 
who was out on this person's center? They've got six other books very, very much in this ser series. That's the way we need to approach this. Mm -hmm. But if we stop at book two and go, well, this isn't working, then later on, if you do come up with a bestseller, all you've got is one. And that's all you've got, you know. So that is, for me, that's the persistent aspect of it. And one more thing. Life will interrupt. You know, there might be an elderly parent that you have to take a break and you have to, um, you know, pay attention and 24-hour care for this loved one. But persistence in this case is getting back to it then once, you know, um, whatever demand was placed on you has been is lifted, then you you come back to it and you don't um, and you watch there too. don't bemoan what what took some time from you, but just be happy and glad that and get back to it. Well, I would, I, I, my, my advice to authors in that situation, I would say, first, life is going to interrupt. Yeah. Just yeah. go ahead and figure that that is part of the, that's part of the package, especially for writers, because people look at writers and go, well, you're a writer, so you have more time than I do. So I'm, I'm running the train over here. I'm keeping the train on time. You got yours writing. So they're going to, you're, they're going to get more demand on your time. And yeah. look at that, look at that caregiving situation from the perspective of God go, what is, what opportunity has God given me? There's something yeah. here. There's something here that somebody can benefit from. And I'm a writer. I can be documenting this. So mm -hmm. while my mother or my father is sleeping, I'm going to be journaling what I'm doing, what's going yeah. on, what I'm learning. And at some point yeah. that's going to be, that's going to become a novel. I mean, you don't, we don't realize if we document it, that's going to be the opening scene of a story about how to care for your dad. And then you're going to go back and tell his backstory later on. It was in the war. It's going to have a romance. How's mom met? Da, 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 da. If you don't journal it, you, you miss it. You've missed the opportunity. You've catered for somebody, but you've missed the writing opportunity. Right. So the last one is have non-negotiable habits, which is a negative. I'm trying to, maybe it's a non-double negative. Non-negotiable. What is that? <laughs> I have to look that one up. That just means you, you, Make your list of, of habits that you're going to uh, put into your life and then don't allow other people to talk you out of them. They're non-negotiable. Like I know, I Eddie's my business partner, but I know his mornings are for his writing. So I don't interrupt him. I try not to anyway, interrupt him during his writing time because for Eddie, that is non-negotiable time. That is time that he has um, set aside. So if you wear that outfit, let the people around you know, these are your practices and don't veer from them. Um, it, it will all bear fruit. Yeah, so I just changed that. I just changed it from what we had to have hard head habits. Have hard, hard. Head, head, hard headed habits, hard headed habits. In other words, I'm going to be so hard headed. You're not going to be able to talk me out of that. Right. And I was thinking about it <clears throat> when you were saying That's that I hate to because, you know, I don't own a smartphone and people that know me just can't believe that I don't own a smartphone. And I mean, I've got a flip phone that I turn on when I need to call somebody, but nobody uh -huh. can call me for the most part, unless I'm at my desk and then I've got a Google number. And that's how people reach me on my laptop or the iPad. Right. But when I leave the house, uh, I'm not on the phone. I don't have, I don't, I'm not, and I'm, I'm hard-headed about this because I want to be, when I'm out, I want to be with people. I'm going someplace. I want to be with people. I want to engage with people. I don't want to be distracted and I don't want to be interrupted because when I go out, I think the people that I'm around, that God is, that this is an opportunity for me. Again, I, I spend most of my time in the house, right? So this is my few opportunity to be with people and see people and they may irritate me, but it's, at least it's people, right? So I'm hard-headed about that. And that's, for me, one of those non-negotiables. It's, you know, Benny was like, why won't you get one? And it's not, it's not that I don't believe in the technology. It's just I believe people, for me, is more important than a phone is and being interrupted. And it's always like, well, what happens if something happens to the kids? Well, it was going to happen to them anyway. <laughs> I'll just find out later, right? So I call it hard-headed habits. And, and you don't want to have too many of those because then you're just a jerk. So you know, <laughs> maybe pick three and, and no more than three, maybe. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's good. 
And I made one final statement here. I put on the bottom here that a lot of um, coaches, uh, we like to say this, the life you live that you currently are living is the life you think you deserve. Mm -hmm. So if you believe God has intended something greater for you, then change your habits. 